Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb, your go-to podcast for up-to-date research-based horticulture and environmental stewardship knowledge to help you grow and manage your garden. Produced by Washington State University Extension Master Gardener Volunteers and brought to you by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. I'm your host, Aaron Hoover, a WSU Extension Master Gardener since 2015 and a certified permaculture designer and modern homesteader. WSU Master Gardener Volunteers are university-trained community educators who have been cultivating plants, people, and communities since 1973. Are you ready to grow? Let's dig into today's episode. Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb, episode 22. My guest today is Mike Carvia, and he's here to talk to us about uh, wildfire preparedness and creating defensible space. Mike is a retired assistant chief with the Pacific County Fire District Number 1 after 30 years of service. He spent 10 years as a volunteer, 20 years in career service, and 30 years as an EMT. His main position was in charge of fire-related training for volunteers and career personnel, instructing classes to other fire departments, firefighting academy, instructing at Clatsop Community College for the fire science program, and conducting firefighter testing for the state of Washington. He started as a master gardener in Grace Harbor Pacific Counties and will receive his 10-year pin this year. Mike, thanks for joining me today. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. So why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and um, your gardening experience and your firefighting experience? Sure. Well, we can start off with my firefighting experience. I've got 30 years of fire service under my belt and 10 years as a volunteer and 20 years career with the same department, Pacific County Fire District 1 on the Long Beach Peninsula. And when I first started 30 years ago, we were running four or 500 calls. And at the end of my tenure, we were up to 3,000 calls. So it's quite a quite an increase. It was great to see that go through this growing spurt. So I've uh, have been a training officer for most of my career and teaching at the community college in the fire science, the high school fire science program, um, other departments, and then testing for the state of Washington for testing firefighters. So all of that was a, a good chapter in my life. It's over with. Uh, it's time to move on. And I am a master gardener with the class of 2014. This year, I get my 10-year pen. And so I'm pretty excited about that. And it's been one of the greatest moves I've made. And uh, here's where you have vetted information. And it's really made me a better gardener, a better person. I love helping instruct some of the master gardener classes that we're undergoing right now. And uh, what a great adventure, just having a good time. So thank you. All right. So what can you tell us a little bit about what defensible space is and why it's important for homeowners, especially in wildfire prone areas? Yeah, it's not only for wildfire prone areas. It really is a concept to adopt. In in all areas, I I think, is my thought on it. And so the defensible space, it's simply a buffer. It's all it is to reduce the impact and increase your chance of surviving, say, a wildland fire um, and not contributing to the fire spread. And so mostly it's done through vegetation management um, in a series of zones that you can create. But the key part about these zones, they are specific to your location, specific to your house, specific to your situation. If you and I have a house side by side built by the same contractor, we have the same footprint, but there's something different about it that's going to be customizable to me. What works for me isn't going to work for you. So we want to reduce this fire. And if you think about the basics, a structure fire, for lack of better words, can start basically three different ways. And so your vegetation is on fire and it's direct flame contact with your house. And that's that's one of the main ways. And then the other one is the radiant heat, you know, and that's the heat energy you feel from the flame, like with a candle, your hand decided at a campfire. And it all depends on the size of the campfire is how far 
back do you have to be from the fire? And so that's that radiant heat energy that's preheating everything from a long distance away. And then another way would be the flying embers, which is also called the flying brands or the sparks. And these travel great distances from the air convection. And then they're going to land on flammable objects, spreading the fire, uh, whatever it is. But the defensible space, and and we'll talk some more about that, but it's a a great concept to adopt, and we'll we'll get into it. It isn't that hard either. We'll take some of the mystery out of it and bring it home to where it's it's easy to understand. Okay, so what are some key factors to take into account when creating a defensible space? Well, that defensible space or that buffer zone that we're creating, I kind of want to do it in a series of layers. And so we can call it a zone. So your first zone can be anywhere like up to five feet, depending on your situation. It may even be a little bit uh, shorter distance than that. But your crucial area to focus on for fire safety Um, and this zone, this buffer that you have between vegetation and your house. And this is where it's accessible for firefighters to get around your place. But I think even more important, it's accessible for you to be able to get around so you can inspect your home. How is your siding, the roofs, the foundation vents? Are your gutters clean? Are your decks and porches clean? Are they a source of the fire? Could they be a source for fire? And uh, don't forget your deck furniture. That's part of it, too. All of this is connected to your home. Are your water faucets accessible? And a key concept that should be employed by everybody. No vegetation is touching your house because your house has to breathe, right? You got to, I got to let, can't have mold growing on my home. So there's a lot of other benefits to that. So that first zone is really crucial. And then the secondary zone, a, a, a term that's frequently used, that's called the lean, clean, and green zone. And this is where you trim your tree limbs from hanging over your roof. You want to keep them 10 foot away from your your roof line. Keep them away from your chimney if you have that. And I want that gap. If I can also in this secondary zone uh, trim tree branches up about six feet and then work on the spacing between the trees. And as you know, in the pruning sessions that we go to, the most important part of pruning is dead disease dying. It doesn't matter what you do. Those have got to go, uh, whether it's just for the health of the tree or for fire safety. Now that secondary zone can go out to 10 feet, 20 feet, whatever is going to work for you and, and not be just specific on that. And your third zone, really, if you have the room, this is where you're going to be used to clear the overhanging vegetation above the road and coming in on the side of the road so the fire Fire apparatus have access to your place, clearing out uh, you know the invasive vegetation that burns really fast, like gorse and scotch broom. And again, here's where we get rid of the dead, disease, dying vegetation. And a 30 feet is really ideal. Take down California where they have the extremes down there. They kind of want a hundred feet. But of course, if if our lots are 50 by a hundred, we're limited in all of this. And so that's why it's totally customizable to to your situation and what's gonna work. So, you know, depend and again to build on that, depending on where you live, the higher the fire severity. Well, the bigger the zone has to be. You know, you move your wood pile away from the house. Is your address sign? Does it have reflective numbers? Can it be seen from different directions? All that's in kind of in zone three there to give yourself that fighting chance that you need and then work your way to your house and uh, to give you the, the best chance you can. You'll never, ever eliminate the risk. You can only reduce it. So are there some specific plant choices that can help um, in that that middle zone or even in the outer zone that would help either slow it down or, or not be as quick to ignite? Yeah, there really is. And so we'll talk about good 
um, vegetation to plant and maybe something that isn't so good to plant too. So having natural native plants, so they're used to the environment, they're used to not being watered and it, it doesn't have to be a, a native plant. People, they, it has to be a native plant. Well, no, it doesn't. And as long as it has a high moisture content to it, you know, some great ones are uh, azalea and rhododendrons, you know, lavender, see them, a yucca and agave and ice plants are really good to have around your area. They're beautiful and they can help slow that fire down as it comes up to them. Uh, something to consider is maybe uh, reconsider ornamental grasses because they grow in this giant clump and have they die back in the winter, leave all these combustible leaves and stems on the ground. And if you have that type of grass, you know, be a good homeowner, cut them down in the fall and remove all the cuttings and deal with it. And then they'll, they'll grow back. But this big clump, if that big clump catches on fire, you'll have what's called like this uh, exothermic burst of energy and you'll have that radiant heat energy just coming out and preheating everything so reconsider them or plan them away if you still wanted to have them you know we take a look at the hardscape and so we're looking at the area area around the house and maybe there's something a little better than wood chips and bark in there and of course it's more expensive when i start looking at gravel pea gravel lava rock pavers all of that is expensive but on the other hand it's a one and done and so once you get that down there, and of course, we've got to do some weeding in there and uh, be able to manage it that way and think about building a rock garden in there and having something along that line. Something else to consider are not planting some of the, the looser papery bark trees, like the uh, paperback marple, uh, maple, excuse me, some of the dogwoods, the river birch, that thin peeling layer of bark ignites out easily, allowing the flames to ladder up the trunk of the tree and travel to the limbs and on. So those are just some considerations that there are. Everything looks nice and cute and pretty when we first plant it. Uh, we got to look in the crystal ball and how big is it going to get and what are the characteristics of this plant so there there are some good plants to plant um i i don't believe in the concept of don't plant anything you know that doesn't work for me and it doesn't work for a lot of people it's okay to go ahead and plant stuff in there especially in our area we don't have that it's not that big of an issue, but down in California, it certainly is. And so here's where they have this rockway spread out 10 feet all the way from the house, you know. And, and so I, I think you, there was a happy medium in there that you can find in planting something that works. And at a uh, class I had given and I had talked about some of the vegetation to be able to plant and in front of a window, say you had a, a child's bedroom window. Well, you could plant something in there. You can still, you can plant a rose, but make sure it has thorns or gooseberry, which has thorns, which is going to provide protection from somebody wanting to crawl through the window. Right? So there's another, another concept of defensible space there. You still want to plant something. I, I believe there's that happy medium that we can, balance in there. How does the layout or design of a property affect the zones or the, the defensibility against wildfires? You know, that's a huge issue. It really is. Having good access to your home, whatever your driveway length is, whatever it is, uh, make sure it's wide enough to allow fire suppression apparatus to get there. It's about 12 feet wide is an ideal width we want to look for. And don't get in the mindset set that it's just a brush truck that's going to be coming down well if it's a big enough fire that may take a fire engine and what's bigger than a fire engine is a water tender and so here you have this water tender coming through and uh, making sure are the tree limbs over the road or they cut back do you have huge potholes uh, hit the address sign again is it easy to read and and not just mailbox numbers on there so the the fire department 
if, if you think about it, the, the fire department doesn't have an obligation to go down your poorly ma maintained driveway. I don't have to tear off my mirrors. I don't have to tear off the light bar. I don't have to tear off the ladders getting down there. You know, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm not going to damage a hundreds of thousands of dollar apparatus to get down there. And if we are delayed because we have to hand jack or hand light fire hose out there, well, you know, I'm sorry. But maintaining that the, the layout and the design of whatever it is you're going to do. Siding your home with the fire-resistant materials, cement board is great. And uh, another part about that is cement board trim that's on there. Maybe tile for the roofing. That doesn't maybe work all that well here. Uh, making sure, can you cover your foundation vents? Do you have access to them, your roof vents? The last we, thing we want is any em flying embers, brand sparks traveling through them. And uh, some people are just going to, I'm still, I don't care what you say. I'm still going to have cedar siding and I'm still going to have a cedar roof. Well, that's okay. It's your, your place, you know, and another part about the design of the, the property and the layout, uh, what kind of fence are you putting in a wood fence, a metal fence um, is what type type of construction is it going to be and will it contribute to the fire spread if you think about it a fence a continuous fence could be like a fuse so if the fire is burning here it's going to keep burning until it runs out of fuel so the the layout of what it is you're doing is is pretty important for uh, the protection of everybody so what about the role of maintenance and i mean obviously you have to maintain your home and your plantings. Um, but how, you know, I mean, how, what does that look like or how, you know, how are we maintaining these to, to prevent fire spread? Yeah. Maintenance is an ongoing, uh, situation we have to deal with. Welcome to the Pacific Northwest. Maintenance is a, a key word there because if you don't maintain something, then you're into the next level, which is repairs and repairs are expensive. So with your, your maintenance in there, and here's where we're dealing with, um, you know, the, the protection of your house. And again, the dead disease, dying, trimming things up, the plant spacing, and it's, it's a never ending job for us here in the Pacific Northwest. We're always mowing, cutting, trimming, clearing, painting, cleaning every year. You let your guard down one year and you have twice as much work the next year. So maintenance is an ongoing uh, component of it. But, uh, and it's something that uh, needs to be taken serious. It, it, it is a big deal uh, to be able to stop that because one of the, We'll get into it a little bit later. One of where you don't want to be is it can't happen to me. And that's going to come back and, and not be a good experience. Are there common misconceptions about defensible space that should be addressed? Sure. And I'll, I'll hit it on it again. Uh, it's all attitude. It won't happen to me. And so then, yeah, that's a, a pretty poor attitude to have. And that a lot of people will, don't really understand it and they should ask for help because uh, they think it's, well, it's too hard. It's too difficult. It costs too much. It's too much work. Well, you may not accomplish it all in one year, but you keep going and pick away at it and, and it makes a difference. Some of the misconceptions are, well, I'm going to cut my lawn short and and I'm not going to have to worry about it. Well, if you don't water it, um, the lawn dies and this short lawn, one inch tall, will burn and it will keep burning as where the wind is pushing it and it'll keep burning until it runs out of fuel or there's human inter intervention in it. And so the, the, the cut lawn works, but either you... Um, water it or you make a defensible space around your your own fire pit for instance people think that green vegetation won't burn well basic concept is nothing's fireproof uh, but things are fire resistant but even then with enough heat the vegetation will dry out the vegetation will burn and will contribute to the fire spread so are there resources for homeowners to get input or feedback um, about their zones of defensible space? 
Yeah, there are. There really are. So my first words of advice are to, well, go on the internet and take a look at what Department of Natural Resources, the U.S. Fire Service, and understand what they have to say about the defensible zones. Probably one of the best words of advice is get a hold of your local fire department. Ask them for a courtesy site visit. Will you please come out and take a look at my place and give me your professional opinion on wildland management for my area and what is it I need? What is it I'm not saying? What is it I'm not recognizing? And uh, that's a great resource right there. Yeah, I think a lot of people, they get so used to their environment that it's hard to look at it objectively because you're just so used to seeing it. So having a somebody else come in and look at it gives it a fresh perspective. And like you said, it's something that maybe the homeowner wouldn't see. Can you, do you have any success stories to share about how defensible space has helped um, protect structures or property? Yep. Firsthand experience being in the fighting a lot of dune fires, the wildland fires, the uh, mowing your, your lawn, cutting down that dune grass. Pacific County will let you maintain a protection dif- distance, but they say 50 feet from an existing structure. It is amazing how the dune grass burns and it will come up to this mowed area and it just stops it and is fantastic. So mowing that dune grass slows it down and stops, you know, and again, success stories are people who made the effort to trim vegetation sideways and heightways so that apparatus can get down. That address signpost is so important. Go to your fire department and a lot of them have a address signpost program where they'll put it, they will install it. You pay for it. They'll install it out at the front of the road so that everybody can see it, whether it is law enforcement, UPS, the mail service, whatever it is, garbage. And so everybody benefits from that. And again, the success stories of modern construction, the cement board siding, uh, tram has made a real impact on, on the spread of fire. So how can homeowners stay informed about current fire conditions uh, during wildfire? Well, all the time, but especially during wildfire season. Well, I had a lot of fun with this one, doing some more research on it and making sure I got, and then I started looking into it and I'm going, I'll bet the majority of people do not know the three levels of wildfire evacuation. So you get the phone call. So you've been notified by your neighbors, the internet, TV, reverse 911. There is an active emergency in your area. Well, and so everybody's going, well, it's a level one. So it's making sure you understand what that is. And that is the time to prepare to leave. So a person who is aware of this, they're going to have an emergency plan. And I'll get into that in just a second here. And you need to have maybe a map for an evacuation uh, route. And how are you going to get off? where you are. One of the unfortunate parts about living on the peninsula is there's one way on, one way off. That's about it. Unless you got a boat and you can only do that at certain places and hopefully the tide will work with you or a helicopter, right? So that really isn't too viable a lot of times. But do you have a a go kit? And so it's also known as a like a bug out bag, a bail out bag, uh, a good bag, G-O-O-D, which is get out of Dodge, uh, the P-E-R-K, the personal emergency relocation kit, and my favorite, the M-H-R-B, and that's when the manure hits the rotating blade. And so do you, <laughs> so do you have a bag? Are you ready to leave? And so I'll get into that. And this is especially important. If you have children, elderly, or disabilities, you should consider leaving now. You got to give yourself time to evacuate. Now is the time to get your computer, chargers for the phones, valuables that are easily to carry, and that 
let's hit on the evacuation bags. One concept you can apply, some people keep them full, partially full. Some people keep them in, empty, but they have a list inside there. This bag is for food. Don't forget to go to the pantry and get canned food only. This bag is for medications. This one's for valuables. This one's for clothing. And making sure that it's not paper sacks, but good sturdy two-handle bags that can carry weight and volume in there. And so that's that level one. You've been notified, hey, there's something going on and you better pay attention. This isn't, well, I'm going to wait for level two. No, you better pay attention. Now we get on to level two and this is the substantial dangers nearby. That emergency is less predictable. You may have time to gather your necessary items, but you do it fast and at your own risk. Now would be a good time to leave at a, at a level two. And a level three, you leave right now. You drop what you're doing, you grab your keys, you leave with the clothes on your back, and you get out of Dodge right now. The time to organize has passed. You don't have time to go back and get everything. No, it's time to leave. And so understanding those three different levels, because this is what's going to be broadcast over the news media and making sure people have a, a good understanding about uh, what it is that's happening and stay informed, stay involved, contact your neighbors and share that information. Um, are there any specific resources or organizations that you would recommend to learn more about Defensible Space? Yeah, uh, again, the United States Fire Service, the Department of Natural Resources, uh, FEMA has a, a website called ready.gov, R-E-A-D-Y dot gov, and it has different preparedness levels to review all the way from a hurricane, tornado, a flood, wildland fire, and they have a mobile app to get real-time weather and emergency alerts from there. We talked about contacting your local fire department for a site safety visit and just for having to take a look at everything. Get a hold of your county's emergency management. A lot of them have the ability to contact you through, through programs. In Pacific County, they have what's called hyperreach and that you will receive notifications of instances that are coming on. Didn't cost you anything. And they'll tell you about the weather and community alerts. But those were just some very basic basic, simple ones. And the websites are very user-friendly. They want you to go to them. They want you to take a look at them. They want you to understand um, about what it is, the hazards that there are. And so it's a, a really good a resource. There's a lot of them out there. And make sure you get some good resources and and that have uh, validity to them and not just uh, somebody's opinion. Yeah, we'll uh, link to some of those resources in the show notes, too, so they're easy to find. How can property owners protect their homes and property from or even prevent fires from fire hazards within the home, like lithium ion batteries or things like that? Yeah, the uh, here's uh, something that everybody needs to pay attention to. We don't want to be part of the problem. We don't want to contribute to any, have a fire or contribute to the fire. And people need to really pay attention to the lithium ion batteries. You know, they power our lives every day. We use them, phone, laptops, children's toys. And the problem with them is when they ignite, they burn very hot and they release their own oxygen, which makes them burn hotter. So the bigger issue is the many poor quality of batteries and cheap chargers on the market. They're overused, charged too long. Look for that UL sticker. Do yourself a favor. Don't save money. Pay a few extra dollars and get one that's going to uh, be safe and make a difference. And as a matter of fact, it is such a widespread problem across the country. You know, policymakers, they're updating fire codes. They're passing new housing regulations. San Francisco said no uh, extension cords on a uh, lithium-ion battery charging unit. No extension cords on it. 
you take a lot of universities like the University of Maryland. They have bans on parking electric vehicles uh, inside some of the campus vehicles. Where the, and no, there's no electric skateboards or scooters are allowed. It is that big of a problem, and we don't want to contribute to that problem. And so it's just kind of an eye opening. Do some fact checking if you'd like to, and check it out. But we want to be safe within our own at home and not be part of the, any of the problems. So are there um, other things to think of besides just the lithium ion batteries? Well, you know, it can anything that's going to help you out, the smoke detectors, a lot of people do not know that smoke detectors have a lifespan of 10 years. That's all. That's that's the lifespan of them. And that's why when you go to some of the big box stores and you buy smoke detectors, there's 10 year smoke detectors. There's not 11 year. There's not 12 year. There's only 10 year smoke detectors. And so these are the ones that you want to get because it's a one and done at the end of the 10 year life cycle. It's easily disposed of having a, a smoke detector. The carbon monoxide detectors are, are very important and a, a valuable resource. Certainly can undervalue the power of a fire extinguisher. And it is a uh, the fire extinguisher is uh, has it certainly has its place. Um, contact your local fire department for communication on what is it going to take to have a good fire extinguisher and which ones need, can be refilled and which ones do you throw away. And having that, having an evacuation plan, have a plan uh, in your home is just huge. And take when your kids, uh, if you have young kids and they do the fire evacuation plan at school and bring it home, you know, take it serious because it's being taught in class for a reason in there and, and making sure that everybody's aware. How does the struggle to recruit and retain wildland firefighters affect property owners and their need to create defensible space? This is a huge issue in the in the fire service that the United States Fire Service, they're struggling. They've been struggling for years to retain wildland firefighters. There's a um, 45% attrition rate amongst its permanent employees. Fewer new individuals are applying. Wages start at $15 an hour for entry level, poor compensation, poor benefits, the high costs associated with the job. And one of the, the amazing, most difficult part of it is, is the, uh, the hiring process. They have this arduous, unnecessary hiring process that you consistently read about. And uh, why are you doing this? The cost of living, competitive pay from other fire agencies, all of this is leading to the struggles the U.S. Fire Service has in combating the wildland fires. And I'll resort back to we have to help ourselves. We have to make things happen ourselves. And knowing that this federal agency is having problems, um, we, we still can we could help. It was, but we it's up to us. How can we help? Well, you know, you can know your your hazards. You can create the fire zones. You can, how do I get out? Where do I go for an evacuation a, a route? Um, have you analyzed the, the fuel mitigation on your property? How are you going to do that? Assessing your your property. When we take a look at the fire in Maui, where they had such a huge problem there, the emergency system failed the people. The, the system failed. And they didn't give insufficient warnings. The sirens didn't go off because of poor decision making. Evacua evacuation orders were late. Communication between agencies wasn't adequate. Water supply could be met. They couldn't draft out of the ocean. Well, you're an island. You're surrounded by water. What do you mean you don't have any water? Well, the, the terrain and the high winds prevented them from doing that. So the fire department didn't break. It was basically outmatched by li having limited resources, the high winds, the extreme fire conditions. I mean, good golly, it burned over 6,000 acres, destroyed 2,000 structures, took over 100 lives, 6 billion property loss, 13,000 people displaced. And it was because of the fire, weather, fire conditions, fuel, and the system let the people down. You know, when it comes to 
the firefighting, I, I'm fond of saying in my classes that when you're fighting fire, it's a battle between BTU and GPM, the one with the most wins. If you don't have enough water to fight the BTU, get out of the way because there's nothing you can do. But if I have enough water resources and, and uh, manpower, then I'm going to I'm going to take that risk, that calculated risk, and get in there and tackle the monster and and make it happen. Are there some decisions that property owners could make that would help mitigate some of the threats, like they saw in Maui? You know, some of it was beyond a lot of the public's control. Some of it was beyond their control. But again, taking care of vegetation management taking care of problem that you have so you're not part of the bigger problem. There's so much going on in the world and everybody keeps blaming, you know, climate change. Well, you know, cl- climate change, it, nobody can deny that it's happening, whether it's man-made or cyclic is a, another discussion. But the, the basic fact is that in the Western U.S., it's hotter and drier, makes the wildland fires worse. All the climate models are forecasting average summer temperatures uh, that will increase, but ignition is the wild card. So what if it's hotter? So what if it's drier? That happens. It's the ignition sources we need to be concerned about. In Alaska, most of the fires are started by lightning. In California, it's people. So the wildland firefighting is so crucial because it's, it's part of our ecosystem. It, it clears out the dead underbrush and the aging foliage and it spreads new seeds and enables biodiversity. Well, the government's going, well, we're going to put it out. And, and it just creates a larger and more dangerous fuel load. And so there's huge parts of our country. Some of the scientists are calling we're in a fire deficit. They haven't burned for such a long time and they need to which means the fires are only going to get bigger, badder, and more destructive. And so there is so many uh, contributing factors in there that I, I really want to um, make a point on ask for help. That, that's a big part of it right there. Ask for help. There's a lot of knowledgeable people out there that, that can help you out. And again, I really want to stress that this is your zones. This is your issue. And what works for somebody else isn't going to work for me. So I've got to customize it uh, for from the problems that I have. So do you see any trends or upcoming technologies or innovations that could help with wildfire prevention or um, defensible space practices? You know, there's, uh, yes, I do. Drones are here. They're here to stay. They're uh, we're finding new uses for them every day in the wildland sector. They are able to be launched and go out into remote areas to where maybe radar is saying, well, there's possibly fire. We've had lightning strikes over there where they can send drones out and have eyes on the situation instead of boots on the ground to confirm what's going on. They have drones, a technique for creating this defensible space in the wildland world is a what's called a backburn. And so a backburn is a very organized, specialized tactic where we are going to burn this area out ahead of the fire coming to us, which is going to slow down or stop or redirect the fire in there. So they have drones that can drop these fireballs and they can start a fire on purpose in specific areas. And, and instead of, and again, instead of having boots on the ground, they can have the the eyes in the sky to be able to make these decisions. So the technology is fabulous, just fantastic, finding new, new uses for it every day. And all of that's going to make a difference. But again, it's the uh, the people. It's people are, are the problem. So people can be the solution too. Very nice. You're absolutely right. We can be part of the solution. We're very good at problem recognition, but sometimes we're not very good at problem solution. All right. So is there anything else you want to add about uh, defensible space and um, home gardens? You know, it's it's very easy to do. It isn't hard. It's not a difficult concept. It is not expensive. It is achievable through a series of steps that you want to make. 
and it, it, it can be done. And we have a responsibility to be able to do that too, not only for the protection of our investment of our home, but also for the protection of the environment and protection of not being part of the problem. And, you know, it's just, and then that gives us more time to garden and be able to, <laughs> to have more fun out in the garden and plant new and unique plants and harvest our vegetables and have fun and, uh, and give us other things to worry about than this. But it, it is a true problem, but, and it's heavily recognized and, and the right people understand it. But of course, as with any problem, it's time and money. All right. Well, thanks for being here. This has been great. Well, thank you so much for the invite. I had a great time. It was a wonderful experience and, and all is well. Thank you much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Evergreen Thumb, brought to you by the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program volunteers and sponsored by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. We hope that today's discussion has inspired and equipped you with valuable insights to nurture your garden. The Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State is a nonprofit organization whose primary purpose is to provide unifying support and advocacy for WSU Extension Master Gardener programs throughout Washington State. To support the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State, visit www.mastergardenerfoundation.org forward slash donate. Whether you're an experienced Master Gardener or just starting out, the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is here to support you every step of the way. WSU Extension Master Gardeners empower and sustain diverse communities with relevant, unbiased, research-based horticulture education. Reach out to your local WSU Extension office to connect with Master Gardeners and tap into a wealth of resources that can help you achieve gardening success. To learn more about the program or how to become a Master Gardener, visit mastergardener.wsu.edu forward slash get hyphen involved. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to stay connected with us, be sure to subscribe to future episodes filled with expert tips, fascinating stories, and practical advice. Don't forget to leave a review and share it with fellow gardeners to spread the joy of gardening. Questions or comments to be addressed in future episodes can be sent to hello at theevergreenthumb.org. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by guests of this podcast are their own and do not imply endorsement by Washington State University or the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. Mm -hmm.